Okay, so our first speaker is Dr. Uh, Bred Bredesen. Uh, he's an internationally recognized as an expert in the mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. He graduated from Caltech, and then served as MD from Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Car Carolina. He served as chief resident in neuro neuro neurology at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, before joining Nor Nobel Laureate Stanley Prosner's laboratory at UCSF as an NIH postdoctoral fellow. He held faculty positions at UCSF, UCLA, and the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Bredesen directed the program on aging at the Burnham Institute before coming to the Beck Institute in 1998 as its founding president and CEO. Let's welcome, and he'll be talking on reversing Alzheimer's disease. Okay, can you hear me okay? Great, okay, great. Okay, well, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight, I think, is relevant for the sorts of things we've been hearing. All I have to say, I don't understand the discovery of the cerebrospinal fluid. I'm not quite sure I understand that concept, because it's been around for hundreds of years. But obviously, there's something new here. So um, we have been spent the last 27 years uh, looking at the most fundamental nature of neurodegeneration. So the question has been, why do neurons degenerate? Why do you get Alzheimer's? Why is it such an incredibly common disease? And if you, in fact, look around, the number that's always quoted is 5.2 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. But that's actually a very misleading number because, of course, most Americans are too young to know that they're going to get it. So the number that you really want to know is of the 320 million currently living Americans, I have two daughters in their 20s, you know, I don't know if they're going to get it or not, how many of those 320 million Americans will get Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is about 45 million of us will get it. So it's about 15% of the population. Um, and the claim now is that it has become the third leading cause of death. And as you probably know, uh, it is, has become the uh, major concern of us uh, as we age. So it's often said that there is nothing that will prevent, reverse, or slow the progress of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, if you go on the Alzheimer's Association website, you'll see that quote. Uh, so a common thing that's said, and as I'll show you today, that's no longer the case. And the other thing that's commonly said is everyone knows someone who's a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor. And again, I'll show you some of the first ones today. So um, how many people here deal with people with cognitive decline? Yeah, so mo yeah, most people, I mean, if, and if you don't deal with it uh, medically, then it's, it may be in your family. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a very, very common problem as we age, and as you know, it's been something that has been really difficult to do anything about. Now, let's see if we can, uh, so I'm going to show you a couple of people here, and you may have seen people like this before. Um, this particular guy uh, has two of the kind of classic things that uh, presented. Can you, can you see this okay? I, I had an anger problem. I, my typical mild self <laughs> returned to an ogre. My, um, <clears throat> my daughter had come to live with her two kids with us. And it, it turned out that I just couldn't cope with the kids. I wasn't uh, prepared to raise kids again, so it was natural for me to be angry. But I, my anger was out of control. I would really have spells of anger. And then the other thing that happened was that I was having spells, very briefly, of driving down a familiar street and suddenly being unable to remember where I was. I couldn't remember whether I was supposed to turn. So this guy says two of the classic things that we hear from people relatively early in the process. One of the things is that he couldn't do something he could do before. He couldn't handle, in this case, couldn't handle the grandkids. I'll show you another woman who just could not handle uh, putting a bunch of data together for her government reports. Very common thing to hear. On the other hand, if you, know, if you look at this guy, he still, at this point in the disease, looks pretty normal. You, if you saw him on the street, you wouldn't think anything specific. He's still articulate at this time. Uh, and of course, as you'll see with the next person, that all is going to change. 
The second thing that he has is that, as he says, he's going along a place that was familiar before, and then he suddenly realizes he's just not sure which way to turn, and he's not sure where he is. And so spatial memory, a huge issue, a very, very common problem with these people. Now this next guy, you'll see, is a guy, this guy was a big shot Hollywood editor, and you can see automatically that you know, if you see him, you already know something is wrong here. And he's, of course, farther along in the process. Hey, Dad. Um what did you do for a living before you retired? Uh, um, <laughs> do you remember? I, uh, yeah. I worked in, in Idaho. Making Idaho spuds. Do you remember working in Hollywood? Oh, yes. And did you know that you were like a big shot editor in Hollywood? <laughs> Do you remember that? Uh, yeah. Okay. So he uses a very common approach, which is you just kind of agree with things. And of course, if you dig down and say, well, you know, who are your partners and what was your address? And he doesn't know any of that stuff. So a very, very common strategy, uh, strategy these people use. So as you know, the numbers are staggering. Uh, you know, as I just mentioned, 45 million of us are going to get this during our lifetimes of the current uh, living American. So it's a huge problem, and as you know, it's going to bankrupt Medicare if we don't do something about it. Uh, back in 2011, President Obama signed into law the National Alzheimer's Project Act, the NAPA, um, and we had our first meeting in 2012 and sat around and said, okay, what are we going to do about this? So for the first time, our country now has a plan. The problem is the plan doesn't involve anything about how are we going to fix it. It just says this is, we should do something about this. And as you probably know, President Obama has said he'd like to see something that is 25% better than what we currently have by 2025. Well, you know, 2025 is a long time for people who are early in the process today. So we'd really like to do something much, much earlier than that. And of course, the big problem is if we don't make a major change, this is going to have all sorts of huge impacts uh, on our lives. This is a major, major problem. And at the same time, as you know, um, there have been no cures. There's, there hasn't been any way. So you basically go in, uh, you get uh, Aricept or Nemenda, um, and things don't work very well. It's a major problem. And as you probably know, uh, women are actually at the uh, epicenter of this epidemic. Uh, and actually, just uh, Maria Shriver just had us on the Today Show about a week ago talking about this. She's very big on activism. Um, one of her points has been, if you are a woman today, your chance of having uh, Alzheimer's disease during your lifetime has now exceeded your chance of getting breast cancer. So this is a huge, huge problem. And women represent about 65% of the patients and about 60% of the caregivers. So ma major problem. And on the other hand, as you know, if you take care of these people, it is a really sad state of affairs. It's really a, a confused state of affairs because people don't know what to do. Because there is nothing that really works well, first thing happens is the patients wait a long time. They know that there's not a lot to do. They know that they're probably going to lose their driver's license. They know that if they try to get long-term care insurance and the doctor's already said memory loss in the chart, they will not be able to get long-term care insurance. In fact, the first woman I'll show you here um, who's doing very, very well now, uh, that was the way it started. She went to her doctor who said, yes, you got the same thing your mother had and there's nothing I can do for you. He wrote in the chart memory problems. She went to try to get long-term care insurance. They told her, no, we're not going to give this to you because you have early Alzheimer's. And so she decided to commit suicide. And this is how she ended up coming out to us. So then, of course, at some point, people finally do go in and see their primary care providers, and the primary care providers say, look, I can write a prescription for Aricept. I know the neurologist can't do anything more than that, so I, you know, why do I want to refer this person? And if they ever do get referred, then what happens is, the, uh, the, whether it's a university center or what have you, they will say, okay, look, I can't help you, but I can make sure that you can't drive. I can make sure that you don't get long-term care insurance, but if you wouldn't mind coming back every six months for a spinal tap, that would help me renew my grant. So this is the sad state of affairs that we have with Alzheimer's disease today and just cognitive decline in general. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible situation. So I want to show you an example. So this is a, from a real patient uh, who saw actually a famous neurologist at a very famous center. There are three centers in the United States that are held up as the a gold standard uh, for Alzheimer's centers. This one, uh, I won't name it, but it's not on, it's not on the West Coast. Uh, it's, uh, it's elsewhere. 
Um, but I want to show you the sort of evaluation and treatment that this particular guy got. It's very, very typical. So this is the best of the best of the best that our country has to offer. So as the guy said, he got MRI of the brain, blood for a complete blood count, metabolic panel, thyroids, B12. He says, I asked the patient and his wife to keep an eye on his disabilities to manage money, medications, and transportation. I prescribed Aricept five milligrams once per day. Okay, here's what he didn't do, and you've just been talking about some of this stuff. He didn't do any genetics. He didn't ask, is this guy, is he APOE4 positive, negative, is he a heterozygote, a homozygote? He didn't look at any of the other contributors, TREM2, CD33, NALP1, PS1, on and on and on. Um, there are over 100 different determinants, and it's helpful to know wh where does this person stand, and especially with respect to APOE status, because it does matter in terms of how you deal with these people. He didn't ask anything about whether this person had any inflammation going on. Um, which is amazing. I mean, there's this feeling in the neurological community that Alzheimer's is divorced from everything going on in the rest of your body, um, which I think is, is just is crazy, especially with the whole functional medicine revolution is really short-sighted. So nothing about inflammation, nothing about his homocysteine, despite all sorts of uh, information on the relationship of a homocysteine to cerebral and hippocampal atrophy. Nothing about his fasting insulin, despite all the insulin resistance associated with Alzheimer's. Nothing about his hormonal status. Nothing about thyroid, testosterone, and so forth and so on. Nothing regarding any sort of exposure to any toxins, even though things like mercury and now many biotoxins are being associated with cognitive decline. Nothing about the innate immune system status. Where does he stand? What is, you know, what is his C4A? What is his TGF beta 1? Well, what is the status on these things? Nothing about his gut health despite the tremendous growing literature on the importance of gut health in cognition, in Parkinson's, in many different chronic conditions. Nothing about his microbiome, nothing about the blood-brain barrier. Is it patent, is it not patent? Um, and what about MRI volumetrics? He did an MRI, but he didn't bother to look at hippocampal volume uh, or any other region, just on and on and on. So there's just this kind of feeling that we just zip these people through. We don't check much. There's nothing you do. You, hand, you throw them on Aricept and sorry. And you know this is a, a horrible way to look at this condition. And then again, you know, he gave this guy Aricept without even knowing the diagnosis. Interestingly, so this guy then came out to California. This guy is an East Coast guy. Um, he, he showed up. His BMI is 33. This wasn't even noted in the doctor's note uh, from the Alzheimer's uh, Center. Um, no plan to address it at all. Um, this guy, of course, ended up having prediabetes, a key risk factor for cognitive decline. Wasn't mentioned, not, no plan to address it, nothing. So this is the best of the best of the best that our country currently has to offer in its major university centers for Alzheimer's disease that are being supported by the NIH as the best we have to offer. Uh, and you know, we can do better, we can do better than this. So I wanna show you now a couple of patients um, and some of the first, in fact, this was actually uh, patient zero here. Uh, who's now just turned 72 not too long ago. Um, this is a woman uh, who came in. Her mother had died with Alzheimer's disease, had started her symptoms when she was 62. This woman started her symptoms when she was 65. She was almost identical to that first man that I showed you, except she was a little farther along than that. In fact, I showed him to her, and she said, oh, boy, I really know how he feels. So she had many of the same symptoms. So she was unable to navigate on the freeway, and she talks a little bit about this couldn't remember what she'd read. So her job for the government is she, she does these reports. She goes all, all over the world and she does these very complicated reports for the government. She simply couldn't crunch the data anymore. Unable to prepare her reports, couldn't remember even four digit numbers. I mean, she was having significant issues and she knew it. She ended up having a retinal scan that showed amyloid, so she had early Alzheimer's. We treated her with a program that I'll show you, which we call RECODE, Reversal of Cognitive Decline. So she talks a little bit here about her story. What happened was she called me after she was on this program for three months and she said, I can't believe it. I'm better than I've been in many, many years. I'm back at work full time, everything's great. And so she came back out and I said, do you mind if I film you? And she said, as long as you don't use my name. So you'll see that people I'm gonna show you here that have been on this program, are, their faces are pixelated or, uh, or shaded just because they're back at work full time doing very well. She's now four and a half years into this program and still doing very well. Interestingly, she has stopped the program for various reasons four different times. All four times she got worse, she went back on it, she got better again. And so we've, we've published her and a number of other people. We have several hundred people on this now and we've just published the first 20. So she talks a little bit about her story here. So tell me a little bit about how things were a year ago. Well, a year ago, 
ago, I was having a lot of difficulty. I was very frustrated because my memory was poor. Um, I had issues of being spatially disoriented, particularly when I was driving. I would get off the freeway at the wrong exit or not know where I was getting back on, on familiar routes. Um, I would reach in my house for a light switch. I'd reach on the wrong wall, even though I'd always had the, the light switch has always been on, on the right side, I'd start reaching to the left. Um, I'd call my animals uh, a different name, uh, my pets, and I was really worried about it. I was very stressed about it, um, so it was, a, it was a very stressful time. And how are things at work? I have a, a job that requires a lot of mental uh, analysis, a lot of thinking. I, you know, I do a lot of research. I have to collect data, design the study, and then do the analysis and write a report, usually under pressure. And I was finding that I just couldn't complete an assignment. I couldn't think about the analysis. Um, it was just a jumble to me. And I would start procrastinating, putting it off. And the longer I put it off, the more stress I felt. So I was worried that I was not going to be able to continue with my career. Tell me a little bit about how things are now. Things are much improved now. Uh, my memory is much better. In fact, I would even go so far as to say I don't think that I have a problem uh, with memory now, uh, which is a great surprise to me from where I was a year ago. My, my thinking, um, cognitive ability, ability to do work, ability to do reports, um, I am back into the stream of things, being productive and being able to do my analysis and writing, which is fantastic. And how's the driving? Driving, no problem. I drive at night, I drive in the daytime. Um, I know where to get off, where to get on. Um, I'm uh, on, the, on the highway, so I'm, um, I feel like that's a problem. I'm not reaching for the wrong side of the room for the light switch. I'm not calling my pets the wrong name, which I think they're probably grateful for. And how overall are you feeling? I feel great. I feel really, really good. I feel energetic. Uh, I feel more peaceful and calm about my life, but at the same time, very enthusiastic. I've even started writing my book. Fantastic. A couple of chapters. Okay, thank you very much. So she's writing a book about what it's like to get demented and then come back from that. Uh, and we want to show you one other person uh, who's an APOE4 positive. So this guy has very, very well documented Alzheimer's disease, APOE4 positive. Um, had a PET scan that showed very classic, you see this hypo-utilization of glucose in the temporal and parietal lobes, which, which he had. Um, interestingly, this particular guy, and actually this is a guy who goes back and forth between East Coast and West Coast, had neuropsych testing uh, at 2003, 2007, 2013, and you could just see, so it was very well documented, his monotonic decline. And by 2013, he was really doing poorly. So you could see his California verbal learning test, for example, had gone from 84th percentile down to the third percentile. So this guy didn't remember you know, the people we had lunch with. Um, he was struggling. In fact, he had been told uh, by, the, uh, by the neuropsychologist, you know, you should probably think about tying things up, get rid of your, uh, get rid of your offices, et cetera. Um, couldn't remember, you know, faces scheduled. And he did, did what a lot of people do, which is they hire additional assistants. So they kind of just point them in the direction. He could still do his work fairly well, but they would have to tell him where to go and things like that. So interestingly, this guy also had this ability during his adult life where he could look at columns of numbers and add them very quickly. So he would meet with his accountants. He'd say, okay, that's about 420,000. And they were like, wow, that's very close. He lost that with his Alzheimer's. He got it back on this program, and he still has it. So he's doing very well. And interestingly, it took him, and these people all, it takes three to six months to start seeing a turnaround. It doesn't happen overnight. And after six months, his wife called me and said, you know, you're missing the most important thing. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, she said, well, yeah, he's definitely better. She said, but the, really the striking thing was for 18 months prior to the start, he had been accelerating, which as you know happens to many of these people. They'll kind of go along for a while and then they'll really take a turn. So he had really gone off the edge and of course his neuropsych scores showed it. And after he went off the edge, then he started being treated. And she said, right away, he stopped getting worse. And then after a few months, then he started getting better. So. Uh, as I say, his wife notices that his uh, decline completely stopped. So he talks a little bit about his problems here. And went to open the locker at my gym, and I could not remember the combination. Which is, in, uh, as I know myself, that'd be very unusual. And I 
would meet with my accountant, say, and we would just toss out some numbers and I would have the number faster that he'd get to his computer usually. So things like that, that started to wane uh, dramatically. Clearly, I mean, the math has come back. That's a real magical thing. I mean, I'm fast with math again. People I had met, maybe even taken to lunch, I did not know who they were. I mean, it's like a new, new encounter. And then afterwards, they'd say, uh, you actually know this person. So that's gone away, which is a relief. So as you can imagine, the common thing that we hear is, you know, these people didn't have Alzheimer's. And when they got better, it was just subjective. So this guy has well-documented Alzheimer's. And here's the uh, objective uh, look at him. So I, we asked him, actually, after he had gotten better. And he's been on this for a little over two years now. Um, when he got to two years, we asked him to go back to the neuropsychologist again. And he was, it was very interesting because he was very reticent to go back. He said, first of all, said, that guy is you know, so negative, so pessimistic about this. He had told me to kind of wrap things up. So he said, look, I know I'm better. My wife knows I'm better. My coworkers know I'm better. If I go in there and I get tested and he tells me I'm really not better, he said, it's just really going to destroy things. So I said, look, just give it your best shot, see how it goes. So he went in. And I got a call, that we were actually, my wife and I were driving up uh, from UCLA up, up to uh, Marin, and I got a call from the neuropsychologist, and he said, you know, I've been practicing for 30 years. I've never seen this before. So this guy, as you can see here, he went from third percentile on his uh, CVLT2 Part B to 84th percentile, so three standard deviations. Um, you can see, for example, his auditory delayed memory. He went from 13th percentile to 79th percentile. Um, the reverse digit span, on and on. Interestingly, the neuropsychologist said he was actually most interested in the processing speed. And I said, well, why is that? Because, you know, he did well on that before and he did a little better on that. And he said, well, for, because that's one of the things that limits people who have non-Alzheimer related problems, such as people who aging associated problems, uh, traumatic brain injury, that they are often uh, limited by processing speed. So if you can increase the processing speed, that's a good sign. So I want to show you a couple others quickly here. So here's another guy extremely well-documented, amyloid-positive PET scan, FDG-PET-positive PET scan, hippocampal volume, you can see uh, atrophy down to 17th percentile here. Uh, here. And so this guy is a, is a physician in Southern California, brilliant guy. He actually went to a major university when he was 15 years old because he was a genius. Both of his parents died with Alzheimer's disease, APOE4-positive, as you can see. Uh, and this guy would argue with me. He, he actually called UCLA about a year and a half ago now and said, you know, if you guys ever come up with anything, please let me know. I said, well, actually, we're, we're working with people. We're getting some very good results. This was before we had pr uh, published the first of several papers on these people. And so he came in, and um, we started talking about all the different pieces. And of course, he's very classically trained. He doesn't believe in functional medicine. So everything I would say is, you know, that's not important. That's not important. So finally, after a few minutes, I said, look, you know, give me, I said, give me six months. If I can't make you better in six months, then go elsewhere. He said, there is no place else. I said, well, <laughs> all right, then quit arguing with me. Give me a few months. So three months into this, his wife called me and said, he's doing so much better. He's seeing all of his patients, which he still is. I just, just met with him a couple of days ago, um, doing great. Um, and you can see here, you know, as, what, what we found, of course, is as the metabolism goes, so goes the cognition. No surprise, when you're running around with a fasting insulin of 32, uh, you, things are less than optimal. Now, you can see he hasn't gotten to perfect yet. So he hasn't, you know, he's down to eight. We like to see him below five. Um, his HSCRP, you know, again, we like to see it below one. But he's certainly on the right track here. Um, his homocysteine, we, we like to see it below seven. But he's not bad here. Um, this guy was running around with a vitamin D of 21. He's doing better. Again, not perfect, but better. And you can see, certainly, um, the subjective improvements that we see in these people are mirrored. When we look at the objective improvements, they're mirrored very well by the objective improvements. And so this guy, then I, I said to him, look, we need to have you go back and let's get your hippocampal volume done again. And he said, you don't grow new brain. And I said, well, OK. But I said, you know, there are some studies where just with exercise, people have very modest increases in hippocampal volume. Let's see where you stand. And so he went in, and it came out 75th percentile. And then the, neuro, the, uh, the neuroradiologist actually contacted us and said, we've made a mistake. And we said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we've done 75,000 scans at this particular hospital. We've never seen this before. So obviously, it was a mistake. And what was interesting, they were actually in the middle of, without data, correcting this. So this would say, 
35, and this would say 35. And I said, well, what, is, is that what it says? He said, no. I said, well, why would you change the report? He said, because you can't grow brain like that. I said, well, so I said, can I get the films from you and we'll take them to a separate reader. So as you know, NeuroQuant does reading and then separately NeuroReader does it. So this was a NeuroQuant one here. So we took it to NeuroReader blindly and they ended up pointing out this is actually a little lower than 17, this is actually a little higher than 75th. So it's very interesting when people are presented with something that they don't expect and they haven't seen it before, they just will not believe it. So this guy's doing great. Here's another one. This one, so this is actually a person who's APOE 4.4. And as you know, if you have no copies of APOE 4, uh, then how many people know their APOE status here? Yeah, so a number of people. So if you have zero copies, your chance of getting Alzheimer's during your life is about, in the aggregate, about 9%. Um, if you have a single copy, it's somewhere around 30%. And if you have two copies, it's above 50%. And some would argue it's 90%. It's, it depends on what study you read, but it's more likely that you will get it than you won't. And in fact, there are 7 million APOE4 homozygotes in the United States. So our argument is, let's identify all of them and prevent all of them from getting it. That's the goal. And there's a wonderful website you may know of, apoe4.info, where people who are APOE4 positive share, and they've got, uh, there, are, there are about now 700 people on that, and the, the woman who founded this, is Julie G, uh, told me that 99% of them are on some version of our protocol now, um, and they're getting all sorts of stories about people improving, so we're very excited about that. This particular, this is one of the people from that group, and so you can see here, um, she was doing fairly poorly here, and you can see all the dramatic improvements that she had. This was at over five months. So she's doing well. So I want to just spend a couple of minutes then. We, we basically looked at two different, completely different approaches to understand what's actually driving this. I mean, this is coming out of the test tube. I didn't see patients for 20 plus years while we were working in the lab. And the idea was, let's ask in a simple model, how, what is actually driving this problem? And so we took two different approaches. And what was really interesting, they were from two different angles, but we ended up in exactly the same place. So we were very excited about that. So the first approach we took was to say, OK, what's the most common thing that's associated with Alzheimer's disease? APOE4. It accounts for about 65% of all Alzheimer's disease. And I should mention, there are 75 million heterozygotes in the United States and 7 million homozygotes. And the reality is, none of them should ever get Alzheimer's disease. That's the way things are headed. So the problem, as you probably know, has been here's the APOE4. Here's, on the other hand, the end stage. You get phosphatau, you get A-beta, you get the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. But it's never been clear what's in the middle. So eight years ago now, um, we set out, seven, eight, seven and a half, eight, right around there, we set out then to understand what's in the black box. How do you link this? Because the reality is APOE is just a fat bucket, right? It's, it's a protein, apolipoprotein E, that carries around lipids. That's its job. So the question is, what the heck does that have to do with Alzheimer's disease? And it turned out to be an incredibly interesting story. So I call this the chimp that killed the rhino. So what happened, of course, between five and seven million years ago, the simians had ultimately the hominids, which became all of us, um, uh, diverged from these. And so what happened, of course, God came down and touched the simians with DNA. And he made a finite number of mutations, right, that are associated with being a hominid. And so, of course, as you know, chimps and humans are remarkably similar in their DNA. And so as I told my wife, you know, uh, my DNA as a whole is more similar to a male chimp DNA than it is to hers. And she said, duh. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's like, that's obvious, right? So the bottom line is we are remarkably similar to the simians. Now, if you look at the changes, the few changes that were made between the simians and the hominids, the surprise is that an, an inordinate number of them were about pro-inflammatory state. Why is that? And of course, APOE4 is a great example. So APOE4 seems to have appeared with the hominids. The chimp APOE is different. 
And APOE4 is pro-inflammatory, as are a number of these other changes that allowed us to be hominids. So that's been a big question. Why is this? And so Tuck Finch, a professor down at USC, believes he has an answer, and our data support his idea. So his idea is, okay, what does it take to change niches? If you come down out of the trees and you start walking along the savanna, what do you do? You step on all sorts of stuff, you get infections in your feet, you fight with each other, you go longer between meals, you eat meat that has microbes in it, full of microbes, because we don't have fire at that point. So all these things will kill you if you don't have a pro-inflammatory state. So you're very good at fighting these things if you are APOE4 positive. And to this day, if you're brought up in a squalid third world environment, you tend to do better if you are APOE4 positive. On the other hand, it's what they call you know, antagonistic pleiotropy. Good when you're young, not so good for you when you're older. It tends to limit, it shortens your lifespan overall. So there are very few centenarians who are APOE4 homozygotes, although there are some. Um, it increases your risk for Alzheimer's. It increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. It increases your inflammation overall. So it's a good thing in some ways, and it's a bad thing in other ways. And so we wanted to understand why is that? Why would a fat bucket, this is like your butcher. The butcher's the guy who carries around the fat. Why would that change all of these things? Okay, so it allowed us, <clears throat> it allowed us to become the humans that we are today. So you go back here, well for 96%, of all of hominid evolution, everyone has been APOE4 double positive, homozygous. It's only been in the last 220,000 years that APOE3 appeared. And most of us are 3-3s, three now that's the common thing. And then just in the last 80,000 years here did APOE2 appear. So it's a good thing to know where you stand because it does have to do with, for example, how long you wanna fast at night and things like that. If you look at the structure of these two, you'll see the common, APOE2 is actually relatively uncommon. So these are the common ones. So APOE4, the original one that we all had until just 220,000 years ago, you can see it looks like columns and it's because, see this arginine 61 here, right here, that is a threonine in the chimp. So this changes, and you can see here, this positive charge interacts with this glutamate 255 negative charge to hold these together. And this is called domain interaction by the group at Gladstone that originally characterized this. On the other hand, then what happened 220,000 years ago, you have a second mutation here, cysteine 112. So now you have the cysteine interacting with this arginine, which allows this guy now to swing freely out here. So now you have something that looks like a nutcracker instead of something that looks like columns. So two quite different molecules, actually. So we wanted to know how the heck does this work and what does carrying around fat have to do with risk for Alzheimer's disease and why does it have anything to do with inflammation? And we found something really surprising. What we found is that when APOE4 binds and it binds to a number of different receptors, that was known, goes into your cell, but the surprise was it goes into the nucleus, just what we were hearing about a few minutes ago with uh, nuclear uh, thyroid hormone. So it turns out APOE4 also goes into the nucleus. It interacts with a molecule called RELA, which is part of NF-kappa B, part of the inflammatory response. And when it enters the nucleus, it binds to 1,700 different gene promoters. And so we mapped all 1,700 of these. You can look and see what these things are. And you could not tell a better story for Alzheimer's disease. So it actually changes the programming of the cell, which had never been appreciated before. So what this tells you is the butcher, your butcher who's carrying around the fat, also turns out to be your senator who's making the laws of the land. That's the big surprise. So what happens is when you are in an APOE4 dominant cell, and as you know, cells switch back and forth between different states. When you are in an APOE4 state, APOE4 turns on an inflammatory cascade that involves RELA. So you are in a RELA dominant state, basically. And this is just like living in North Korea. It just says, we're going to devote our resources to defense. Great if you're exposed to lots of bacteria and viruses and things like that, great to have that. On the other hand, if you are in an APOE3 dominant system, you're in a sir t one dominant. sir t one of course, is the reason that people take resveratrol and all that stuff, the stuff that comes from red wine. It is a different cellular state. Instead of 
being in North Korea, you're now in South Korea. So you're putting more of your resources into recycling, into research, and into longevity. It's actually, you have a different metabolism here than you do here. So two very different states. And in fact, if you look at these 1,700 different genes that APOE4 binds to uh, in their promoter regions, you couldn't tell a better story, as I mentioned, for Alzheimer's. So it had to do with inflammation. They have to do with microtubule disassembly. Interestingly, glucose homeostasis, synaptic dysfunction, and so forth and so on. In fact, interestingly, um, APOE4 actually binds to the promoter of SIRT1 itself and shuts down the SIRT1 by about 80%. So dramatic decrease in SIRT1 activity in the presence of APOE4. So we took a second approach. We said, okay, the molecule that's at the center part of Alzheimer's, as you know, the thing that is in the plaques of Alzheimer's is amyloid beta, right? That's this little guy right here. So amyloid beta, this A beta, comes from a parent here. This parent is called amyloid precursor protein. So this APP gives rise to either these two or these four, depending on whether it's cut here or cut here, here, and here. And what it turned out is it very much the same sort of story as we saw before. So this thing turns out to be a molecular switch. So in fact, this side is actually supporting neurite growth, synaptic production and synaptic maintenance. This side is supporting pullback of synapses. So it's a little bit like if you have two contractors who work with you at your house. Imagine that for 20 years, here are the guys that do the construction. Here are the guys that do the demolition. Now imagine that for 20 years, the guys that did the demolition always did a little extra for you, and the guys that did the construction never showed up for 20 years. Your house would just start getting smaller and smaller, right? And that's exactly, as you know, that's what happens in osteoporosis. The osteoclastic activity outstrips the osteoblastic activity, whereas when you're young, you have this beautiful balance. We found that the exact same story happens in Alzheimer's disease. So the synaptoblastic activity, which is supported by this side, is outstripped by the synaptoclastic activity, which is on this side. Now, in a mouse, we know why. We have what we call Mousheimer's. And in Mousheimer's mice, we know what's causing it because we give them mutations that cause them to have Alzheimer's. Everybody with Alzheimer's has too much of this side and too little of this side. Why? Why are you on the wrong side of this? Well, we then thought, OK, let's now map that. And what it turns out when you map that, you can see all the different things that are input. So the bottom line is what I was just mentioning. If you have osteoporosis, you have your osteoblastic activity outstripped by your osteoclastic activity. If you have cancer, then your cytoblastic activity outstrips your cytoclastic activity. And no different if you have Alzheimer's your synaptoblastic activity is outstripped by your synaptoclastic activity. So too much pulling back, you're too much on the wrong side of that. Now, again, in a mouse, it's simple. We know what's causing it. But the question was, what's causing this in human beings? And it turns out to be very interesting. If you look at what fits in, what actually feeds in to this amyloid precursor protein, this guy that I was just showing you that's the switch, it turns out that there are many things. And interestingly, it's the very things that we know epidemiologically are critical for Alzheimer's. So everything from your estradiol level to your thyroid level to your cortisol level to your status with respect to insulin to whether you have APOE4 to whether you exercise under what stress you're under, how much sleep you have, if you have sleep apnea, on and on and on and on and on. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of these things that fit directly. And you can look literally look at the molecular interactors to see. And for a simple example, estradiol turns on, of course, many genes. One of the genes it turns on is the one that cuts the APP at the good site, that pushes it to the good site. So there's a direct link there between estradiol and APP going on the right side. So we thought, OK, if we want to prevent and reverse this disease, then what we want to do is we want to address all of those things. We want to know where each person stands, and then we want to address all of them. So what I tell the patients is, OK, imagine you had a roof with 36 holes in it. We use 36 because when we first mapped all these different things, we came up with 36. Now we know there are a few more, but it's not going to be 1,000. It's going to be somewhere less than 100. So we look at these things, and OK, if you are going to help yourself, 
If you take a drug for Alzheimer's, it patches one hole. It patches the hole beautifully, but it's only one hole. So we want to patch all the holes. And the good news is we can patch all the holes, and the drugs are helpful. You can use them, but you want to use them with it, the background of the program. So just like any person dealing with chronic complex illnesses, whether it's cardiovascular disease or cancer or osteoporosis, you want to look at all the upstream causes. You want to get at the root problem. So if you actually wanted to have a single pill for Alzheimer's, how would you, you, know, how would you get it? Well, this is what it would have to do. So, and we actually have a, so we have a, a group that does drug screening for Alzheimer's, and so we've, we actually have a drug that's in trial now in, in Australia. But the problem is you can see how hard it is to get one drug that does everything you want for Alzheimer's disease. On the other hand, this is exactly what functional medicine is designed to do, to look at all the different pieces that are actually causing the problem. And this is why, for the people that have gotten better on our program, there's not a single person so far who's gotten better, and then if they've kept on the program, that they've lost that. They've all sustained, and we're now, the, as I say, the longest one out is four and a half years, but we have a number of people who are two, three, four years that are doing great. So they seem to sustain it. When they stop it, they get worse. So of course what we want to do, and we've started to train, we have practitioner training, we have the next one in December. We've had people now trained from seven different countries and all over the US. And so the idea is, you look here, you know, we're very good these days. Today's physician, very good, they know about DNA, they know about RNA, they know about metabolomics, proteomics, but they don't, as you could see from that workup that I showed you earlier, they don't put the whole person together. And on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the traditional Chinese physicians, and of course the Ayurvedic physicians as well, very good at looking at the whole person. But of course they knew nothing about DNA or RNA or metabolomics. So what we need to do is to train a new group of physicians that understands, <laughs> right, that understands how the whole body works together, the whole system, but at the same time is able to understand DNA, RNA, and so forth and so on. So that's, that's the idea going forward. So just to finish up then over the next few minutes, so the central concepts, the, what we're trying to do here is that if you actually step back and say, well, what is Alzheimer's? You know, we used to accept, hundreds of years ago, we accepted the idea that someone died of fever. When was the last time you looked on and someone said, you know, someone said, oh yeah, they died of fever? Well, now we say, well, no, fever due to what? Was it due to pneumococcal pneumonia? Was it due to a UTI? You know, what was it? And so now with Alzheimer's, we have to quit saying the person died of Alzheimer's, period. Alzheimer's due to what? So if you actually look at the pathology, Alzheimer's disease turns out to be a pathologist's diagnosis. You have plaques and tangles, but if you actually look at what causes it, it's really the production of this stuff, this, this amyloid that the, the brain makes happens because it's a protective response to three different things. Number one, you had infection slash inflammation. So whether you have sterile inflammation or infection-related inflammation, that calls out amyloid and puts you on the wrong side of that balance that I showed you a minute ago. The second thing, if you want to have a brain make amyloid, the second thing you do, drop all of its trophic support, get rid of its nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, thyroid hormone, estradiol, testosterone, vitamin D. What it does then, it downsizes. There's a downsizing program that involves amyloid. That's type, what we call type two Alzheimer's. And then there's a third group, which is people who are exposed to toxins. And whether these are mercury or copper or biotoxins like mycotoxins, these things are bound by the amyloid. So amyloid is a really good protector against things like mercury. So you want to have your brain make amyloid, um, get exposed to some mercury. Go, we had actually one guy, very interesting guy from Southern California, called me about a year ago. And this guy had already been to a couple of doctors, had a PET scan, he had early Alzheimer's. They told him, come back in a year, you're not that bad yet. And he said, you know, something's wrong here, that things are not going well. And so um, he had a very typical, what we call type three Alzheimer's disease. So I told him, look, you have type three. Type three is always associated with some toxin. We just have to identify the toxin. He said, no, I'm not, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm a business guy, I'm not exposed to anything. He had the highest mercury level that had been recorded by the lab in years. And what had tur was, turned out to be really interesting, this guy had gotten very successful in his business, and he decided that he was going to eat tuna sushi 
anytime he felt like it. So he was eating tuna sushi all the time. That was the first thing. Second, he had a whole bunch of amalgams that had never been dealt with. And the third thing, he turned out to be an extremely poor excreter. So he was very poor at clearing his mercury. So those things working together, he was off the chart. So in fact, if you use, how many people use Quicksilver for looking for metals? So some people do. So as you know, Quicksilver, they've got a 95th percentile. So this guy was seven times the 95th percentile um, on Quicksilver. So he was just way, way off the charts. And he's done great. He's been treated and uh, he's, you know, took months to come back, but he's done very, very well. So, so as I say, what's referred to as Alzheimer's disease is really a protective response to three different things. And when you evaluate these people, you want to look to see, okay, how much is this and how much is, so we actually have a computer algorithm that we use um, that tells you how much is type 1, type 2, type 3. And interestingly, the type 1 inflammatory and the type 2 uh, and what we call antitrophic, these things, the, the, a very common thing is that people will have some of both because they are glycotoxics. So they have the insulin resistance, therefore they're not responding to insulin, which gives them the type 2 atrophic piece. But they also have high advanced glycation end products. So what do they have? Inflammation. So they have type 1 and type 2. So we call that one type 1.5. And then type 4 is vascular and type 5 is traumatic, but these are both related to type 2. It's basically three things that give you this. And so we now look at just over 100 different things. And again, you know, if you were looking at, uh, you know, if you're using a computer, you can look at, you know, 3.3 billion base pairs is, is nothing for a computer. So the idea of looking at 100 or a few hundred or even 1,000 different things um, to look at this disease is really nothing for a computer. Um, and we need to do much better at looking. We're, right now, we're looking at people um, and these are incredibly complex organisms that are now going to die of a degenerative condition of their brain. And we're asking, well, your sodium, your potassium, that doesn't, doesn't really help us. You know, we're going to let you go. And in fact, if you just dig a little deeper, you can see why these people get the cognitive decline. Um, and I wanted to spend just a couple minutes talking about this type. We published this about a little over a year ago. We call this type 3 Alzheimer's. And these are the people who have the, uh, the toxin associated. It's a very interesting story. You can diagnose this over the telephone because type 1 and type 2 are pretty similar. They typically present with memory loss, a very typical, like the ones you saw here. But type 3 is like a distant cousin. They present very differently. Um, they look different. They act different. And you have to do something different to make them respond. For one thing, they're usually pretty young. So the typical patient I have with type 3, and we have a, about uh, 15 of them now uh, from all over the world, um, and, uh, and we have a number that are, that are just they're doing great, they're typically in their 50s. Uh, in fact, the typical patient is um, you know, a 52-year-old woman who's just going through menopause and now uh, has Alzheimer's. Now, how did that happen? Goes to a university center and, sorry, you have Alzheimer's. They're usually, interestingly, APOE4 negative, surprisingly. So it's different than type 1 and 2. Usually, the family history is negative. So they're saying, why did I get Alzheimer's? You know, my mother and father didn't have it. Nobody in my family has it. These people, interestingly, often have low triglycerides and often low zinc. Uh, and then the other thing that's interesting, they have the HPA axis dysfunction, um, what people had called uh, adrenal stress in the past. Um, and interestingly, very common for them to present with depression. I've had a number of emails since we published this from a person saying, wow, you know, I just read this paper and you know, this is exactly what's happening to my husband, sister, wife, you know, whatever. Um, and interestingly, they typically don't start with problems with memory. Sometimes they do, but usually not. They usually start with problems, really cortical. It's what people have called cortical Alzheimer's in the past. So I always ask them about how's your math, and they uh, often have trouble with math. They often have executive dysfunction, so problems with organizing things, um, and then problems with word finding. If they have any of those things that are more than the memory problem, you know, be careful. They these people, when they have this type, Virtually 100% have some toxic exposure, be it mercury, mycotoxins, you know, SIRS related. How many people deal with SIRS patients? So just one, I guess. Not too many. Okay. So this is chronic inflammatory response syndrome that, that Richie Shoemaker de defined a number of years ago. Um, and these are people that have very uh, characteristic hallmarks, C4A increases, TGF beta increases. It's really an innate immune system activation due to biotoxins. And interestingly, that's exactly what these people have. 
Um, and, and interestingly, they don't have the rest of the SIRS symptoms. They don't typically have asthma or epistaxis or things like that, but they, they have cognitive decline. And when you treat the SIRS, the cognitive decline goes away. The other thing is they're extremely sensitive to stress. So when they stay up all night or travel, they do very poorly. And interestingly, this is often called atypical Alzheimer's. So we have a one woman from Kentucky, for example, went to a neurologist, the neurologist said, yeah, you're, you're, yeah she's 52 years old, young. Um, if he did the CSF and said, oh, wait a minute, wait, you, you have Alzheimer's disease, which she does, but she has type three Alzheimer's. He thought she had frontotemporal dementia because they often will have some frontal abnormalities. And he was surprised. Then he did a PET scan and again confirmed she has Alzheimer's disease. And she's now doing better on the approach that we use to, to treat this looking at the SIRS. And then they have, as I mentioned, high C4As, high TGF betas, low uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone. Interestingly, they have HLA DRDQs, which what uh, Shoemaker called dreaded, um, which is multiple biotoxin sensitive. Most of them have that. Um, they have Marcons, the multiply antibiotic resistant coag negative staph in the deep uh, nasopharynx. They have visual contrast sensitivity abnormalities, just like people with SIRS. And surprisingly, most of them do not have allergic symptoms. Most do not fulfill, therefore, the criteria for SIRS, yet they have laboratory values that are compatible with that. Um, and there's a great website, Surviving Mold. There's also a great book, uh, Surviving Mold, Life, Life in the Era of Dangerous Buildings by Shoemaker about this sort of stuff. And interestingly, we're seeing people who have Lewy body disease who also seem to be related to the type threes. It is the most difficult type of Alzheimer's disease to treat, but if you recognize it and you get them on treatment, which includes things like cholestyramine, which Shoemaker had recommended, um, intravenous uh, glutathione, treatment of their Marcons if they had it, intranasal VIP, these things are all helpful for these people. And the most important thing of all, of course, is to get them away from the source. Most of them have massive mycotoxin exposure. You can pick it up in their urine. You can go, we actually, I just got one today, uh, a, a, a Hertz me score, which is a, a score for uh, how bad your house is with respect to mold. And it was the highest I've ever seen. If you have 500 colonies of aspergillus, that's considered bad. This person had 12,000. So just massive, massive. So of course, people don't know this. So what happens, they're getting Alzheimer's and they're actually exposed to something that's triggering this. And the doctor's telling them, I'm sorry, you have Alzheimer's, you're gonna die. Um, so here's a, a woman, for example, this is a woman actually who was seen at University of Utah. So this woman presented with depression after hysterectomy. And at first they just said, oh yeah, you have depression. But it became clear over the next few years that she actually had Alzheimer's disease, um, which was then documented. So in four years, developed word finding problems, you know, very typical story. She declined markedly with stress, sleep deprivation, viral illnesses, all these things made her much worse. Neuropsych, she scored very, very poorly. Poor semantic fluency, again, another common thing. Frontal temporal parietal deficits. She had a PET scan, classic for Alzheimer's disease. Seen at a university dementia center, as I mentioned. They started her on an antidepressant and also on Aricept. She turned out to be ApoE33, so again, atypical for Alzheimer's. Negative family history. HSCRP was only 0.2, but her C4A turned out to be 5547. It shouldn't be more than 2830. TGF beta one, high. She failed the visual contrast sensitivity. She didn't end up having Lyme disease. She had massive, massive antithyroglobulin antibodies, you know, one to 2,000, uh, way, way high. So we treated her with the approach that we developed, but in addition, she had the intranasal VIP. And she's actually, she's come around and her MOCA scores have increased. Um, her husband wrote to me, a uh, very interesting story where they got into the car and he said, oh, I forgot the directions. She said, oh, no, no, you go know, right here, left here, left. It was 15 miles. And she knew every, so he said, she could never have done that six months before that. So uh, very excited to see uh, her improvement. And these are just some of the uh, haplotypes here. So you can see here, the, all these people with the red all had this type three and they all had these, um, these HLA DRDQs, which are actually relatively uncommon in the general population. So a good thing to know. So just to finish up then, these, I know the time's getting late here. So um, what we wanna do then is close the complexity gap. So the idea is 
we're looking at people. People are extremely complex, and yet we're not asking too many questions. We're, we're not asking, you know, most people don't get a whole genome, but the genome is just the beginning. We really want to know the metabolome. We want to know, you know, why do you get the disease that you get it for? You know, this is, and this is functional medicine, but this is the future for chronic complex illnesses. This is the way we can understand why you're getting them, how to prevent them, and how to reverse them. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And so I don't know, have any, anybody know about neural exosomes? Ah, okay, so, so it's really interesting work and uh, there's a guy up at UCSF, uh, Ed Getzel, who's doing some very interesting, he's published a number of things on this. So the idea is if you take one cc of blood, there are 1.2 billion exosomes in that cc of blood. And these are tiny little 100 nanometer globules that are fragments of cells. And they come from all over your body, but it turns out 10% of them come from your brain. So he's actually isolated the 10% from the brain arrest, away from the rest. And the cool thing, I mean, this is, to me, this is the, kind of the holy grail. You can now look at brain function in a blood sample. We've never been able to do that before. So he's just looking for it. One of the things he's found, by the way, very interesting, that you can see Alzheimer's uh, years ahead of time. And one of the things, one of the signatures of people about to get Alzheimer's is that they have insulin resistance in their brains. That's not, whether they have it peripherally or not, they have it centrally, which is very exciting. So I think this is a really important thing for the future. And the next thing, we're working with a group up in Seattle, um, the Institute for Systems Biology. This is Lee Hood. Lee is the guy who built the sequencers for the human genome, amazing guy. Um, and so they look at what they call the dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds. They do you know, whole genome sequencing and all sorts of metabolomics. And so what's happening, they're running across all these people who are APOE4 positive. They don't have anything to tell them. So now we're now working with them to make certain, sure that we can prevent it in all these people. Of course, microbiomes, everyone's aware of this. This is like becoming a huge issue. And then we heard a little bit before about uh, POSIT, and certainly Brain HQ is of all the different things that people use for brain training, it's by far the best documented in terms of just data. Over 130 papers, Mike Mersnick, who, in, who started this, actually just got a major award, was at the White House, uh, got the so-called Kavli Prize in neuroscience. So they actually have a lot more proof than any of the other groups um, that their training actually does something. Um, and then uh, the program itself, um, so we look, basically, we look at the very things I showed you. We look at specifics of inflammation, um, and if people are inflamed, we include these resolvents, this SPM active that's just come out not too long ago. Most important thing is to remove the source of the inflammation. We look at whether they have chronic infections. Many of them turn out to have chronic infections. We had a woman just recently who's done very well in the program, and she had a few abnormalities still, and we said there's something being missed here. And it turned out she was actually negative for Borrelia, but she had babesiosis. Um, so these people are coming up again and again. If you have chronic inflammation, there is a reason for it. Either you're you know, eating something wrong or you're exposed to some pathogen, but there's a reason. And then for the type 2, the atrophics, we want to optimize their thyroid and their cortisol and their pregnenolone and their progesterone, their estradiol, their testosterone. All these things turn out to be very supportive. And then if they're exposed to toxins, you can measure that and you can get rid of them. And then metabolism, including glycotoxicity. Probably the most common thing we see is someone who's got a fasting insulin. I showed you the guy with 32. But more common, we see people with fasting insulins of 10, 12, 15, hemoglobin A1Cs of you know, 5.6 to 6.5 in that range. These are people who are harming their own cognition with their glycotoxicity. And then finally, regeneration and protection. You, that's why you know, we heard a little before about uh, exercise, critical piece. What you eat, um, when you fast, whether you do that 12 to 16 hour fast between the end of dinner and the first meal the next day is critical. Whether you have those three hours before you go to bed, whether you're eating low glycemic foods, whether you have that ketotic state, one of the parts of the program is for people to measure their own beta hydroxybutyrate. You can get these you know, cheap ketone meters, as you know. So how many people use ketone meters? Okay, a couple. Okay. Well, yeah, the sticks aren't as good overall, but the ketone meters will give you the beta hydroxybutyrate. And so what's been suggested, and actually APOE4.info suggests this, um, they, they keep it in between 0.5 and 4 millimolar. Anyway, so okay. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. The three subtypes, Alzheimer's is really a protective response. 
It's just that all the drug companies are trying to get rid of the amyloid. We want to know why you had the amyloid. That's what we want to get rid of, not just get rid. Great to get rid of the amyloid after you get rid of the thing that's causing the amyloid. And then, not surprisingly, the earlier the treat, the better. The first 125 people, over 50% of them responded. And we really, with this approach, we should be able to reduce the global burden of dementia markedly. So thanks again for the invitation. So we have plenty of time for questions. And wait for the mic to come to you before you talk. Can you tell us what to do to prevent Alzheimer's disease or cognitive decline? Yeah, sure. Well, the number one thing to do is to get yourself checked out and see where you stand, what your risk factors are. You should know your APOE status. You should know your HSCRP. You should know your hemoglobin A1C. You should know your fasting insulin. You should know your copper to zinc ratio. You know, so we have a whole list of these things. Um, we have a website. We have, I have a book coming out in, in May on talking about all these patients and what sorts of things. So it lists all the different things to look at. So it's good. So we always say, you know, when you're 50, you turn 50, what do you, how many people got their colonoscopy when they turned 50? Yeah, most people. Great. Yeah, so I, I got mine a little after 50, but I had to get it. My wife and I had his and hers matching colonoscopies for Valentine's Day when we were, uh, so it was, it was kind of depressing. But anyway, the idea is, so why don't we get a cognoscopy when we turn 50, right? So we always tell people, look, when you hit 45 or more, you should get a cognoscopy also. You should know where you stand. Look, if you're walking around like that physician was, walking around with a vitamin D of 21 and a fasting insulin of 32 and an HSCRP of 10, you're killing yourself. You know, you're hurting yourself. And so you should know these things. Then once you have that idea, okay, then you can say, okay, here's the program. So the, what the algorithm does for us is it'll give you the different, you know, what percentage do you have of type 1 risk, type 2 risk, type 3 risk, and then it'll, it'll generate an initial program for you. Okay, here's an initial plan. And again, for patients who are used to coming into a doctor and getting a pill and then just going home and forgetting about it, this is very different for them. They say, wait, wait a minute, you're telling me I have to live differently? But the reality is these are the things that are actually causing your risk. So those are the things you want to address. Hi. Um, can you please tell me how we can get in touch with you um, for your program and also to get tested for yeah. example, I know my homocysteine level is high. Yeah. I don't know how to get it down. And I'm sure there's other imbalances that I have. Yeah. How can I go to you and get tested so I can <coughs> rectify all this? Yeah, so, and of course, your doctor can do this as well. But you can go on, so we have a website. M, it's, it's M as in Mary, P as in Paul, I as in Institute, mpi-cognition.com. So you can go to mpi-cognition.com. Um, and we have, as I say, we have uh, training. We have also have immersion programs. We've had a number of them up in Sonoma. Um, we, we have uh, physician training, which is the next one's December 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And is that in Los Angeles? No, the, so the physician training is actually up at the Buck Institute in Marin. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So, Thank you. The physician training, um, I, I, I think it's $1,500, I think as well. It's three days of training on this program. Hold questions until the mic is there, please. Is there an issue? Oh, mpi-cognition.com. M as in Mary, P as in Paul, I as in Institute. Um, is yes. there a differential association of sinus infection and loss of smell with the different kinds of Alzheimer's disease? I am so glad you brought that up. So, you know, as you know, there's been so much written about the microbiome, the gut microbiome. What we're finding is a more common problem is the rhinocinal microbiome. And this turns out to be huge. So some of the people will have, and many of them will have Marcons, um, will have these you know, multiply antibiotic resistant coag negative staph. But another common problem is people will have various fungi. So they do alter their microbiome. And what it looks like is once you treat, for example, the Marcons, if you don't restore an optimal microbiome, again, just like the gut, if you don't restore it, then in fact you just go on and get the problem again. And it is very commonly associated, especially with the type 3. So as you know, the best, I mean, anyone who's used cocaine knows, the best way into your brain is through your nose. And I just had a really interesting talk with Irene Grant from New York who looks at the, who does her whole practice is on, uh, is on uh, mycotoxins. And, and one of her points is most of the people who end up ha coming in with cognitive decline 
have either you know, erosions, changes, denudation, something. Chronic rhinocytositis is another common one. And you know, the assumption was, again, that these are un unlinked, but in fact, they turn out to be very important. So I think that's a really critical point. And she is working, so now, as you probably know, um, uh, probiotics for the nose are coming out. And she's been using one approach, others use others. Um, one of the things that people had done prior to the ability to get probiotics for the nose is actually to take kimchi juice and basically just rub some and, and restore your, your microbiome. Um, so there's a lot of work going on in this area, and I think it's going to be extremely important for cognitive decline. In your recent interview with yeah. Mark Hyman, you mentioned yeah. something similar to binaural beats that you were using. Is yes. that can you talk about that? And is that something we can access now? Yeah, you can have it's free of charge. Um, we've got it. I can drop box it for you. Um, it's called Neural Agility, uh, and you know we can. It's just it's a 27 megabyte, so I can't really email it easily, but it's easily available on Dropbox. Yeah, and it just basically it drives the hippocampus basically at an appropriate frequency. And so it enhances, it. They, they call it meditation on steroids. It was developed by a neurophysiologist and it does help to kind of relax. So you do it in the evening, about 30 minutes, five times a week-ish. You, you know, get uh, supine, uh, turn out the lights, relax, um, and just do 30 minutes of that. You don't want to do a massive amount. Um, and people find that it enhances. And again, by itself, none of these things is the answer. But when you change the, the network function, and it's just like if you're going to change a company, you don't change one janitor, you're going to change critical linchpins, critical nodes throughout the network. And that's exactly what we're doing. And that's when we see big effects. And we've had a number of people say, hey, you know, um, you know I'm not getting better fast enough. Well, OK, it turns out they're not doing the things you need to do. You need to, to get over a threshold. This is very much what Dean Ornish does for cardiovascular disease. And I've talked to Dean about this many times. When he sees people do all the different parts of the program, they get better. And when they do one, they may get better, they may not get better. You have to get over that threshold to be able to change the network function. Yeah. I have the mic, actually. Uh, I just wanted to weigh in uh, that I intuitively kind of came across these whole set of thinking some time ago. So. Uh, having had Lyme disease, then I went on with a mold toxin problem in my house and cleared all these things up and then mm -hmm. s completely saturated myself with all the hormones that were necessary. And any time any kind of any of those problems had any kind of variation, I had severe cognitive decline. And yeah. then going forward, found myself working in an office building that clearly had mold in the ventilation. Mm -hmm. The entire time I was mm -hmm. there, I had issues. As soon as I got out of that, started uh, changing the, um, uh, the fasting ratio, you know, mm -hmm. having more time where I was fasting and less sugars generally and yeah. the whole thing. And I mean, I just sharpened right up, just yeah. successively and continuously, and it's just all, you know, gone from not being able to remember my words to being able to remember all kinds of things. Now, are there still issues? Yes, there are, so I'll probably come in and get some more testing. But, you know, I think I have some combination of this insulin problem, the type 1 and 2, but I also have mm -hmm. an overlay of the 3 on it. So, And I do have an APOE4 gene. My dad had mm -hmm. 2, you know, and yeah. he clearly suffered from yeah. it. So I'm very vigilant about this because it can make all the difference, clearly. Huge. Huge. So here's the surprise. People, you know, of course, when many of us were training in medical school, they said there are reversible causes of dementia and there is Alzheimer's. So you were supposed to exclude all the reversible causes. So they missed on two points. Number one, there's usually not one cause. As you indicated, you've, almost everybody has multiple things. When we look at the lab values, we always find between 10 and 25 abnormalities. Nobody has zero. Anyone who has cognitive decline, anyway, we find different you know, pieces for all these people. The second thing is, that what people call Alzheimer's disease is included in all these things. So, you know, now you, I, did you get a spinal tap during this time? Okay, so you don't know if you had Alzheimer's markers. Did you get a PET scan or an amyloid scan? I'm okay. ready for all that now. <laughs> okay, so the bottom line is people who have exactly what you describe will sometimes go and get a PET scan and, oh my gosh, this is early Alzheimer's disease. So we call it that because that's what the pathologist tells us to call it, but in fact, it's not a mystery. You know exactly what was driving your cognitive decline, and you fixed it. So, and the reality is many people, and especially when you get it early on, should be able to fix this. We have one really interesting woman who's an attorney back in New York, 
her father end-stage Alzheimer's disease. She started having problems uh, and went to Cornell and said, I want to get on your prevention program because I'm having some problems. And they tested her and said, well, you can't get on a prevention program because we can't prevent it. You already have early disease. So she ended up, she went on our program um, February of 2015. She went back to Cornell November, so nine months later. They tested her again. They said, what have you been doing? You're, you're normal. So her tests were completely back to normal. She was early in the process, and she's still, by the way, doing great, and she just ended up having a high C4A and TGF beta 1. Now we're trying to figure out why. But she had a number of things that were readily identifiable um, and has done you know, very, very well. So you know, want to get it early. She has a single copy of APOE4 herself. So yeah, very, very good point. And please tell more people. Because, for example, the Alzheimer's Association says Alzheimer's has nothing to do um, with mold, mycotoxins, any of that stuff. We have, some, we have time for about one or two more questions, depending on the length of answers. Hi. Um, I heard previously that anticholinergic uh, drugs were implicated. Yeah. Have you found that to be true? Absolutely. Well, that, that, that's epidemiologically, they are. So here's the thing. Again, that's why I like the, the, the research. If you look at this balance, you can see all the things that fit into it. You can see the hormonal piece. You can see the inflammatory piece. You can see the genetic piece. And of course, cholinergics, what you need to make memories, which is you know, why people will take Aricept, which you know, helps a little. But again, by itself, you, it doesn't help you rebuild the network. So you want to rebuild the network, you want to get rid of the inciting agents, and you want to enhance your cholinergic tone in general. So absolutely, you, you know, run around taking things like Benadryl for years, not good for you. Um, and of course, other things, the things that affect GABA receptors, you know, so things like benzodiazepines, also associated, and of course, anesthesia. So we had one woman, for example, who came in and she just crumped after you know, major life stresses, changing jobs, She'd undergone four general anesthesias in the two years before this. Um, menopause, I mean, everything happened at once. She lost everything over those time and just you know, fell off the edge. So the reality is these things sum together, and it's typically not just one thing. But you're absolutely right. There are a number of drugs associated with this, and one of them is the anticholinergics. Yeah, well, they typically have some anticholinergic activity, yeah. Dale, have you looked at Joseph Beckman's work at uh, Linus Pauling Institute and his work with ALS and copper yeah, and sure, driving yeah. copper into the mitochondria? Yeah, so I've known Joe for many years he's and, and he's been yeah. working on this and, and, and I've seen his work and followed his work. And yeah, I think it's interesting and I don't know whether there's any relationship of that state to what we're seeing here. And we get a, a lot of questions about, you know, will this approach help people with Lewy body or frontotemporal? Mm -hmm. As you know, frontotemporal and ALS are closely yeah. linked. Um, and we don't know yet. That's We've just started to work with the first few people who have uh, the Lewy body. And it's, it's very interesting. Lewy body seems to be a close cousin of the type 3 right. Alzheimer's. And some of them have SIRS, uh, or SIRS markers at least. And other ones, interestingly, have high metals. So yeah, good question. Um, and you know, Joe's doing some really interesting work, obviously also on nitric oxide and things yeah. like that. And how about okay. misfolding protein yeah. and lipofusions and all that? and how statins can also be a factor yep. in all so of these. So statins are back, we were just talking about you know, yeah. drugs that are, are risk, and, and we try to get people off statins yeah. for a number of reasons. When we did a screen, so we, one of the things is we all know about carcinogens. How many people test for dementogens? So th this, is, this is true, we're exposed to things that give us cancer or increase our risk, but we're also exposed to things like anesthetic agents and drugs that are risk factors for cognitive decline. These are dementogens. So we set up the screen and looked at all drugs that are out on the market for what do they do to that balance. And guess what? The first thing that came up was it puts you on the wrong side of the balance, statins. And so we published that actually a few years ago. And boy, you know, if you can get away with you know, other things, other ways, diet, exercise, other things to get around statins, it's, it's better for your brain in general, as you know. OK, let's okay, thank, thank you. you.